Hey everyone, I hope you all are doing well. Uh, welcome to the fragment session on uh, plug the vulnerabilities in your app. Uh, I'm Shruti. About me, I work as a security manager at AppSeco. Uh, what I do at AppSeco is taking care of uh, clients and ensuring that uh, they have a smooth journey with the work we do for them. AppSeco was founded in 2015 and uh, we are an application security, uh, cloud security specialist company. You can find us at appseco.com. Uh, also, I will be your moderator for today. Um, so about today's session, uh, this session is going to help you understand the common mistakes mobile app developers uh, make while creating uh, mobile apps. And it will also help you understand how these apps can be vulnerable and how uh, the attackers uh, perceive the mobile app uh, security. So our uh, speakers will explain to you about the mobile application security and also why API design is crucial. Uh, with that, I would like to introduce our speakers for today, uh, Riddhi and Riaz. Say hi. Hello. Hello. Okay. All right. So uh, Riddhi works as an application security analyst at AppSeco. Uh, she also leads the Nal Bangalore uh, chapter, which is India's largest open security community. Uh, she's the developer and maintainer of Yapi, a cloud-based vulnerable hybrid Android app. Uh, then we have Riaz, uh, who works as a head of uh, security research and uh, testing at AppSeco. He's also actively been uh, involved with the Bangalore OAS chapter and uh, Null chapter for the last seven years. He's also one of the chapter leaders for the OAS Bangalore chapter. So Riaz is also uh, frequently uh, been a speaker at uh, various security conferences and events around the world, including Black Hat, uh, Nullcon, Kokon, and uh, OAS AppSec. So that's about our speakers today. Uh, also, before we start, uh, I want to let you all know that we'll be taking uh, questions at the end of the session. So there is a Q&A uh, section on the Zoom if you're attending from Zoom. And also the YouTube uh, has a chat feature where you can post all your questions and uh, we'll be answering them at the end of the session. So over to you, uh, Riddhi and Riaz. Thank you. Thank you, Shruti. Well, thanks, uh, Shruti, for the amazing and uh, really nice uh, introduction to uh, us in uh, the talk Thank as well. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> right. So um, today we are going to talk about uh, uh, you know it's a, it's a cumulative thing about multiple uh, things we've seen as part of our application security journey uh, back in office as well as what we see around the world. The kind of issues that uh, testers frequently find with mobile applications and common mistakes that developers uh, do. Right, and we'll, as uh, Shruti mentioned, we'll be taking all the questions at the end. Um, so use the Q&A uh, section to post your questions there, and we'll take a look at them and uh, try and answer as many as we can. Uh, but in the time, we'll at, at the end of the uh, session. Right, so oh, Shruti's already, already done the introductions. Uh, that's ready. That's me. I'm wearing a hat because I'm a grey hat hacker. So <laughs> uh, that's uh, how I define myself. Um, as I said, we'll cover what uh, we believe the idea of security is from an attacker and developer perspective. And um, we'll also take a look at a bunch of weaknesses that we've come across in our mobile uh, testing journey uh, for all of our, mo a lot of our customers who uh, have mobile applications that they want us to test, right? The kind of weaknesses and the general trend of security issues that we find cover things that developers do, but ideally do not. Right and uh, things that attackers commonly go after when testing mobile applications. We'll also talk about uh, some generic things that developers can do that would uh, harden mobile apps and their backend APIs and uh, ensure that uh, not to a uh, hundred percent, but definitely increase the overall security of uh, mobile apps. And I'll come to why I, I don't say a hundred percent in shortly in, in the slide itself. We also have some bonus content uh, around how do you, if somebody who wants to get started with security testing, right, mobile app security testing, what are the kind of things, what are the tools you would uh, require, how you would set them up, as well as uh, some resources to get you started, right? And then we'll open the symbolic floor for our Q&A session. Right, so let's try and define what is uh, security, right? And I've put mobile security, mobile application security in the bracket there. I'll leave this uh, comic up for couple of seconds, right? Because there is uh, an underlying message that this comic will pass across. And I'll come to that. Right, so 
security is freedom from or resilience against potential harm caused by others this is like the wikipedia definition but essentially in the digital world we are looking at uh, the definition of harm would mean either the loss of confidentiality right commonly see integrity or availability and right? you, you would have seen the cia triangle that uh, a lot of security testers refer to and as well as developers are aware depending on how a violation of the cia has occurred or a presumed violation when it, when you are figuring out security issues that haven't been exploited yet right so but you base it on the assumption that either c i or a is going to be violated what was affected in terms of the component and what is the impact of the violation as in what what was an attacker able to do and it is in case of a presumed violation what can the attacker do right we can calculate uh, the severity of the violation uh, as i was i showed you the comic earlier the most secure system is going to be completely unusable and this comes from and this is a very popular uh, security usability functionality triangle the the closer you move the black dot towards security the less functional and usable it becomes and this holds true for uh, all kinds of systems right and uh, not only uh, web applications but any kind of system out there that has these three components uh, independently so which is why developers find middle grounds and uh, they still uh, end up having bug reports that deal with uh, extremely low non exploitable issues right and then there is this whole confusion about whether this needs to be prioritized in fixing and stuff right but if you use this triangle to base your judgment you'd be able to reach a middle ground this is another obligatory dilbert right as i said uh, completely unusable uh, a completely secure system is going to be an unusable system so i'm um, coming back to the earlier comment i made about mobile application not being a 100% thing right why is security hard with mobile apps right the first and foremost and the biggest thing is and it aligns also with thick clients especially uh, desktop applications if you have them running the code runs in an untrusted environment right you may be a, a seasoned mobile developer and you've written like the best mobile app out there with taken care of all the security aspects of the api of the app and everything right but the the code in fact is running inside an environment you have no control over right and obviously you you want to do this because it's a mobile app you want to ensure you can utilize more client processing power right it's easy to create store and manage data as and when required you can use the you don't have to necessarily dynamic data when it is being created you don't have to send it to the server to be stored the simplified and fast architecture allows right the mobile apps to interact with apis for state control right but because the mobile application is running in an untrusted environment all a whole slew of security issues arise right the other thing that we've noticed is business logic and decisions are made client side to increase efficiency and this could uh, uh, imagine uh, recently we tested an app where there was a mobile uh, there is a file upload feature in the mobile app right when the file upload was successful or rather uh, to ensure that if there is disruption of network traffic while the file is being uploaded the a, a temporary copy of the file was made in one of the temporary directories in the mobile app right and because the business logic ensured uh, wanted uh, had a requirement rather that the file upload needs to be successful it was a uh, regulatory requirement for the application the uh, and when the user logged out the files for, from all the previous users were being stored in a common directory right and that itself becomes a violation because uh, believe it or not a lot of uh, mobile apps mobile devices are shared between users and no, i'm not talking only about uh, like you know old uncles and aunties but def even uh, departments and law enforcement agencies that we worked with in the past have uh, you know department devices that they share between officers based on shift that they have right and there's also a connect a disconnect between developers and security testers as to what kind of issues need to be prioritized what is the significance of these issues uh, can we learn from previous bug reports right there is definitely a disconnect uh, between developers and security testers and sometimes developers do have to wear a security tester hat and we'll come to that at the end uh, so that they can understand uh, security from the point of how security testers are looking at the mobile app and the api um slide of full disclosure uh, ridhi and i are not mobile app or api developers but we definitely understand uh, the security implications of what happens and how do you go about testing mobile apps and apis uh, how they can be attacked and what could an attacker do with the access or data 
right? Uh, more importantly, because all our entire career and AppSecco, uh, for that matter, has uh, aligned with testing mobile applications for customers, mobile applications, their backend APIs, web apps, and cloud-related infra. Uh, that's something that we purely do, right? And uh, which is why uh, we may not understand all the nuances of what a developer does in, in terms of uh, mobile apps or APIs, but definitely uh, from a security standpoint, yes. Uh, most bugs that we are going to talk about, examples that we give from developer perspectives, most uh, are what we have discovered in our uh, real world assessments uh, back at office, right? And uh, some of them are really interesting uh, use case studies, uh, case studies that uh, people have blogged about, right? You, you, there are a lot of familiar uh, bugs that you will see in the next couple of slides. Uh, we will try and skip the why these mistakes occur as that would be a subjective opinion. Uh, we are not here to, uh, this, this is not a blame game presentation essentially because we see these uh, mistakes happening day in day out, but uh, why these happen is a very subjective opinion, right? To understand uh, why these mistakes in code or uh, configuration occur. <coughs> Uh, next section, uh, things developers do, which ideally they should not. A bunch of examples on uh, what we've seen in the past where developers have, uh, you know, uh, made mistakes and why and uh, the how of what the mistakes are. Right, Ridhi, why don't you take over? Uh, Riddhi, you're on mute. <laughs> Am I audible now? Yes, yes, absolutely. Hi. Thank you, Riaz. Mm -hmm. uh, hello, all. So as Riaz mentioned, we'll be looking at a lot of real world examples. And uh, this section, the section that I'm going to talk about is specifically about things that developers do that they shouldn't be or th uh, yeah. So the first thing uh, is uh, we, we depend on a lot of third party code libraries, API stack overflow. And we know that um, if, uh, any developer cannot write the entire code end to end on their own. And we will have to depend on third party libraries and we will have it to look into code written by someone else and we will have to depend on them. But for uh, sensitive features and sensitive functionalities, we will have to be very careful when we are doing so. Uh, on the right side, uh, you see there is a picture and it offers various uh, uh, options to you, options to log in. Now, one of these had um, an issue which was reported uh, recently and it was it is a zero day was found in sign in with apple and the person was paid heavily in millions uh, in indian rupees uh, the issue was now how the auth authentication works when the user um, it tries to log in using the sign in with apple feature there is a jw token which is sent by the server and this jw uh, token is then sent to the third party application, which is trying to use the sign in with Apple feature. Uh, the, uh, the third party application then verifies with the Apple server if this is valid token or not. If it is found to be valid, then the user is allowed to log in. What was the flaw in it? Now, the flaw in it was anybody can. Um, which I'll come in the next section. Here, the problem was there was some issue. At this point, we just need to know that an application is using using sign in with Apple feature, uh, which is not developed by them. It is developed by someone else. So in this case, Apple becomes the third party. And uh, using this feature, it was possible for an attacker to pass any random arbitrary email address, obtain a valid JWT token, and log in as that user. So user impersonation was happening here. Who was the victim? Anybody who was using the sign in with Apple feature, they were uh, they were vulnerable. What was the damage? That a full account takeover of user accounts was possible regardless of whether the victim had a valid Apple ID or not. Now this is a continuation of the same issue that we just spoke about, but it is targeting on a different issue. Uh, the first we saw that we are depending on third parties without verifying if it is safe to use it or not. Second one is uh, we oftentimes we miss uh, validating authentication issues. 
So when we are using API and authentication and authorization play a very important role. So in this particular scenario, if you see the top request, this section here, there is one uh, parameter going in request body, which is an email parameter and it takes an email. So any user can trigger this request and pass any arbitrary email address. If that is a valid email address, then server was generating a valid JWT token. And this is how the response looked like. ID would be obtained from here. So there are basically two issues which uh, you could think of which is happening here. One is uh, obviously authentication. Yeah. Uh, okay, let's not mix the issues. So we are looking at authentication issues. The server is not doing proper validation and is just accepting any uh, arbitrary email address. This is just one example of uh, real world, but in other cases, there could be like you have weak password policy um, because of which I can uh, simply guess the password and log in. Or there could be uh, issues where you, your app allows both uh, authentication, um, authenticated access and unauthenticated access. And it might be a case that maybe you have, uh, there are uh, authentication has been missed for some screens and an unauthenticated user can access that. Uh, so there could be authentications in different forms. So uh, we should make uh, a list of all the sensitive endpoints and we should make sure that authentication checks have been done properly for those endpoints. Third one is oftentimes, and I think this is one uh, very important because oftentimes authentication is mature. We don't find many authentication issues. We do find in rare cases, but authorization issues are something which, uh, which is prevalent in large scale. And authorization issue is almost something that we almost find in all the apps. Almost we have found this issue in almost every app that we have tested so far. This is one example of, uh, this is not a very typical example, but Amazon Cognito, some of you might have heard about it. Uh, for some, it might be a new term, but Amazon Cognito, as you see on the screen from the web, it's taken from the website. What it says is it allows you to uh, handle it does the sign up, sign in, and access control for you. So you don't have to write any code. If you just use uh, frameworks like Amplify, uh, you can simply implement this feature for your app. On the right hand side, you see the, the login page, which is generated when someone uses Amazon Cognito. This is, this is just a sample, um, but yeah, it will look something similar to this. Once this has been set up, you can just, uh, users can log in and uh, they can access your app uh, as required. Now there is a feature in, provided by Amazon Cognito. Uh, what is the feature? Amazon Cognito supports unauthenticated ID identities, which allows customers to use the application without actually logging in. So this is not a flaw, this is a feature. But uh, there is a flaw which uh, surfaced because of this feature. When we, are, uh, when we see the overall picture, we found we, uh, somebody named as Andrea Riancho, he published a paper and the link is down there in the slide. So when, uh, what happens in this, if enabled, if this feature is enabled, that unauthenticated identities is enabled, there are chances that the person can also access uh, your sensitive AWS services. It might be there that uh, this AWS services permissions have not been uh, handled properly and those services could be accessed by as someone who is who has not authenticated themselves uh, to the app. They are unauthenticated user, but they are still valid users as per the app. But definitely they are not supposed to access the sensitive AWS services. So this is how the overall picture looks like if you are getting confused by whatever I said so far. There's a user who tries to use your app using Amazon Cognito, they try to sign in. And uh, Amazon Cognito user pool sends you a token, there is an ID, a uh, Cognito ID, which is sent. Once this ID is received, uh, that ID is sent to the Amazon Co uh, Cognito identity pool and you get a temporary AWS credentials if the token is valid. These, these credentials, using these credentials, we can then try to access various AWS services via brute force method. So oftentimes, and, and this is a very, very valid uh, scenario in these cases, we, uh, in today's scenario. And we have found genuine issues using this use case. So if you see there's uh, this 
it's obviously it's not the entire thing is not mentioned here but uh, if you uh, refer this link which is there on this page uh, you will there is a detailed description of how you can exploit this and how you can uh, test this scenario so this using this enumerate iam.py uh, script whatever temporary credentials have been obtained you can pass it in access key and secret key respectively and then it will enumerate just like this what you see on the screen it will enumerate every service that is accessible so this list is itself in itself is enough to prove that uh, you can access services which are not supposed to be and this could be reported uh, another very interesting uh, issue that we often come across is uh, for some reason uh, developers um, miss implementing rate limiting or if even if they have implemented there are some misses because of which uh, rate limiting doesn't work as it is expected Uh, like in the in this example you can see the this screenshot is from a real project that we did recently and the way rate limiting was api rate limiting was implemented here you can see uh, the it was bug intruder was run and you can see the serial number from 1 to 15 only 15 attempts have been made but it started with 56 and again 54 55 it's never reducing basically in in fact 15 to 1 is 58 even higher than what was it was initially so this x rate limiting remaining was getting reset for some reason so definitely this was an implementation issue what was the real logic i don't know but definitely this is not secure not secure if rate limit is is reached requests are supposed to be blocked requests should get blocked but it was definitely not getting blocked i was able to it was getting blocked it is very strange so when i was using repeater and i was manually trying to uh, trigger the request even then this this was increasing so in reality if you see given this scenario we can assume that there was no uh, rate limiting implementation at all it's as good as not having rate limiting here now as for the documentation um, you will see that there are three headers which are expected and in this example if you see there are only two headers rate limit limit rate limit and uh, remaining but there is no rate limit reset so obviously the system doesn't know where, under what circumstances to reset and something wrong was happening so if if we are trying to experiment with some new features we should definitely be uh, we should definitely read the documentation understand how it is supposed to work and especially when it's a security feature that we are trying to implement and then uh, we should definitely test it out uh there there were two real world examples around this rate limiting um because there was no proper rate, rate limiting so it's not like rate limiting was not there in these two cases which is facebook hack and instagram hack happened it's not like uh, rate limiting was not there rate limiting was there but it was not sufficient in the first case if you see uh this n parameter otp was supposed to be passed here in the forgot password a um, new feature and when the otp is received a uh, user was supposed to enter valid otp here but because of missing rate limiting uh, a user was able to brute force this this password whatever password was generated it was valid for at least 10 minutes and that 10 minute was enough to break this six digit code numeric code and that's how this hack happened um, it was reported on time so there wasn't much damage in instagram gram hack also uh, it was a similar case Uh, in this also again uh, as you see it read uh, uh, instagram had rate limiting but it was not effective enough and in this case also there was a six digit security code and yeah it was easily brute uh, forced uh, ridhi i'll add a uh, couple of things here sure right um folks if you uh, if you come across this facebook uh, bug before the uh, basic idea that was exploited by the uh, bug bounty person was uh, that the www.facebook.com domain had rate limiting right mm -hmm. the same url the same post request if you would make uh, to www.facebook.com right there was rate limiting enabled there right but for beta.facebook.com and there was another domain uh, there was no rate limiting enabled right this essentially shows the disconnect between even uh, when an api is deployed right there might be security features that are administrative in nature you would have something in front of the api as a middleware that takes care of uh, stuff like rate limiting 
in such cases that great limiting middleware was not available or applicable to beta.facebook.com right and um, for the next for the instagram as well uh, six digit security code appears to be safe and because it it has 1 million possible combinations and in real time you can't be brute forcing this but because the endpoint the mobile endpoint for instagram did not have rate limiting enabled right the web one had it essentially it ended up having uh, the attacker was able to set up uh, multiple machines right uh, and crack uh, the six digit security code in under 150 dollars so uh, basically uh, from the impact point of view and the investment point of view uh, the roi was really really high and imagine uh, the attacker could have gained access to anybody's instagram account right that's uh, because the place where the configuration was supposed to be implemented and where uh, the security control was were two different regions yeah. got it yeah thank you as for adding it uh, so the Uh, the next issue which is very common uh, which which again um, i think gradually uh, it was common very common few some time back but gradually this is reducing probably because people are becoming more aware and people um, maybe security aware they are getting but we still do find these issues um, this one is often times uh, we leave sensitive files in app bundle so the apk that we receive what is apk apk is nothing but it has all the files it has assets it has source code and any supporting file that is required for the apk app to work so it's all bundled and it's very easy to unzip the apk or ip and see what is there in the bundle and because apk is supposed to be distributed freely because only if, uh, it, it it could be distributed in various forms but ultimately it is either an apk for android or ipa for ios uh once any person is have you don't have control on who is receiving it anybody who receives it can simply unzip the uh, bundle and see what is inside it uh in this case you are seeing that this uh, there is an uh, apk which has been, been which has been unzipped and there is an xml file android manifest and there are certain files and folders uh inside it now whenever you unzip an uh, android um, apk uh, definitely look into what is there in the res folder or res folder um it will uh, sometimes lot of information a uh, lot of interesting files could be find, found here uh, for example in a, this one so i this uh, this example has been taken from the vulnerable uh, app which i built uh, which is named as vyapi Uh, i did not uh, introduce this deliberately but i was testing because i incorporated uh, amazon cognito um, lo login feature in that uh, and i realized that in the apk when i unzipped it i saw that it has been <coughs> it has placed the aws configuration file in rest raw folder and this is a very sensitive file if you remember some time back i spoke to you about the authorization issue in amazon cognito and uh, there is a pool id so you, many of you might have question how will someone receive this pool id so this is one example that if a file has been not safeguarded properly and if it has sensitive information and if somebody gets hold of it i can uh, easily pick this pool id and fetch temporary aws credentials and then i can see what all services i can get access using this pool id this is one way you can receive uh, id from different ways but in this case the important part to note is that there could be inter and also if you see this file this uh, this if it was a proprietary music nobody was supposed as people were supposed to buy it and they were not supposed to just access it i can uh, just by unzipping this apk i have access to this right similarly uh, you should uh, definitely explore unzip the apk ip and see what all files are lying there uh, so you should never uh, ship sensitive files in apk bundles next one uh, similar to the uh, issue that we just saw but it is slightly different it's not a full fledged file but sometimes we hard code secrets in the source code thinking that nobody will have access to it how will someone see the source code but it's very easy especially in case of android um 
and definitely it should never be in plain text if if you are having secrets it should definitely never be in plain text and uh, sometimes we have found and even in real world uh, testing a uh, security testing while doing a real world security testing we had found a hard coded secret and the funny part was secret was named as secret so for some time i got got confused that is it uh, actually the secret or is it just a variable name it took me some time to understand no it's actually the secret which is lying there in plain text so we did report that so be careful never put a uh, plain text secrets in your source code uh, uh, also this this all example whatever we are talking right now it's uh, all related to data at rest now uh, whenever your app is dealing with sensitive information sometimes we have seen that uh, for example in the left side you are seeing this is whatsapp chat feature and people are talking and that data some uh, is getting probably stored in a sqlite database and it is getting stored in plain text so if your app deals with sensitive information a uh, lot of times um, sqlite database is used to store that data if you you need to uh, be very careful when dealing with sensitive information if it is sensitive just do not uh, store it in a database at all try avoiding and if at all you cannot then uh, definitely it should be encrypted um we have also seen issues in cache files and this is a very common issue um wherein caches are not cleared sometimes it is like caches needed for some feature to work but definitely when the user logs out we have also seen even after a user is logged out there are files lying uh, around a, in the um, device uh, the cache files of which still have sensitive information and obviously again in uh, uh, plain text because if they are encrypted obviously it's of no use unless i can also break encryption but we have seen uh, um, data is there in the files um in plain text in cache files cache is not getting cleared uh, and caches can be in two forms uh, as you see here they could be just random temporary files or they could be also in sqlite databases it could be in both places uh, and some uh, uh, once few times we have observed that files get cleared but database was not getting cleared uh, or vice versa so we have to be uh, we have to be careful when we are dealing with caches and ensure that caches are cleared uh, we have also seen that many times environment check and this is i think it is missed in most of the places uh, where environment checks are missed what is the uh, motive of an attacker uh, um, main motive of any attacker they want to reverse engineer your app so that they can understand the app logic and uh, find bypasses business logic bypasses or uh, to see if there are hard coded secrets or anything so they try to reverse engineer uh, your app but reverse engineering is possible only when uh, you have not put any protections in place and anybody can just use the right tools and uh, obtain the source code intercept communication between server and app this is also main motive so uh, if if you are, your app is doing some uh, sensitive uh, transactions if it is a banking app or it is a um, hospital app or something uh, dealing with very sensitive information Uh, the communication which happens with the server is very interesting and very um, crucial for app users and also for interesting for the attackers so attackers do try to intercept these communication so uh, as riaz has also had also mentioned in the beginning uh, that you do not have control on uh, the environment where the app will be running so if you have not taken basic checks of um, where your Uh, app is going to run then it might be very easier uh, easy to um, break your app and steal information using your app uh, as we have said it's not possible to make it totally secure completely secure but still uh, defense in layer is something that we want to look forward to and few things that go missing is that apps don't check for uh, if the app is being installed on a rooted device or jailbroken device uh, apps do not check if uh, uh, this app is uh, being installed on an emulator uh, or um, because once i am i am able to install the app on a rooted device or jailbroken device or an emulator then it's very easy to ac gain access to the system files if the if, if my 
I have not uh, taken care of obfuscating the code. It becomes very easy to read the code, right? So I can read uh, whatever is there. And obfuscation obviously makes it difficult to understand the code, even if uh, I have, to, uh, um, what do you say, uh, obtained the source code. Encryption, the, uh, we have seen uh, in, in encryption, what could go wrong. When, when encryption is in place, uh, things that are very common and that go wrong uh, are that your encryption keys are very sensitive. So where are you uh, storing your encryption keys? Are you hard coding it? Um, or is it very simple? Can somebody guess it? Can somebody brute force it? Or uh, the second thing is, are you using weak encryption algorithms, which are already flawed? So using a strong encryption um, algorithm is recommended. And uh, it's very important to pay attention to the key management. Certificate pinning, again, um, we, ha uh, we have been able to bypass uh, um, Certificate SSL uh, uh, pinning bypasses had bypasses had been very easy using the right tools. Uh, so it has to be uh, uh, oftentimes it's not de uh, tested that thoroughly, and it's very trivial to bypass SSL pinning checks. So these are some of the things. Uh, tamper prevention. I will let Riaz talk more about these. What uh, developers should do, and yeah, but uh, the thing to take care of uh, uh, here is often times developer do uh, miss out check uh, keeping in mind that where their app is going to run and because of which it makes it easier for attackers to uh, get hold of your app break it steal information intercept the api uh, communication and uh, do damage to your app so uh, over to you rias i'll let you add more to it thanks Riddhi. All right. Do you see the success kid? <laughs> so essentially, a um, uh, couple of things to add on to what Riddhi's covered. She's, she kind of touched upon a lot of uh, things that uh, we see developers do and uh, the kind of ways they can, I mean, if you, obviously, if you know what the problem is, you can obviously encounter what different possible solutions can exist for the problem. So let's take a look at uh, what are the, what are some of the things that developers uh, should be doing. Right? And we've seen this in a lot of cases where uh, applications that we've tested, a couple of applications in our history, where uh, the application is extremely well built, uh, very securely well built. And uh, we've had uh, issues only with the backend APIs, right? Or vice versa, right? So either one of the components has been vulnerable. Couple of things, uh, as in I have a bunch of them to cover, but uh, essentially things to do to improve security, uh, perform unit test cases, especially for complex apps, right? And uh, when I say unit tests, I'm good for especially complex applications which require uh, data input coming from multiple functions. You need to ensure that the business logic part is getting tested actively, right? So unit test cases would allow you to uh, ensure some level of business logic testing is achieved, especially um, things around your authorization would become more clearer. Right? If your code is written in a modular way, you can um, identify any uh, loopholes, security issues, and patch what is required instead of rebuilding like the entire class. Right? Uh, bug fixes, feature updates, and all of the other things are going to be done smoothly if you have uh, code written modularly. Uh, to add on to what uh, Riti mentioned earlier about third party, third party sources, we can't live without them, right? Like all mobile apps essentially at some point in time will have at least the analytics component from a third party uh, source. We need to be aware of the security implications of adding third party sources, right? And this is not necessarily a library or an external binary, even code copied from Stack Overflow, for example, or taken from uh, another GitHub or uh, you know open source project would essentially need to be scrutinized for security issues right? verify the source and be aware of the security state. And if any known issues have been uh, published for that particular uh, binary library before, because your circle of trust is your dog <laughs> and <laughs> you obviously don't trust anybody else. Right. Um, from uh, the environment point of view uh, and uh, just to extend to what you are saying, as I said, uh, at the, right at the beginning of the presentation, the uh, application resides and runs in a very untrusted environment. You don't know who's going to uh, run the app in a rooted phone 
you don't know if the app is going to be run on a device that is going to be shared by multiple people you don't know if the device is going to be run with applications that have been installed uh, you know uh, unsafe applications that have been installed right uh, with the lockdown i'm sure the, the, all of you exist on at least one whatsapp group where you have uncles and aunties sharing images and stuff i'm on one of them where i every two weeks or so i get uh, an apk file by one of my cousins from one of my cousins and uh, with the insistence that i install it on my phone right just because funny cat videos and there is no dirt of that on the internet but try and uh, have an environment detection routine built into your mobile apps just simply so that you can make it difficult for novice hackers to perform runtime analysis if the app is able to detect that it runs in a uh, you know rooted jailbroken emulator simulated environment it makes it difficult for uh, and there are obviously there are ways to bypass it because you physically have the code with you and the mobile app is running in a controlled environment in any case right you could still pass the code but it it kind of weeds out the people who would uh, run after low hanging fruits right tools available with out of box scripts to bypass standard checks are available on the internet and uh, essentially if, unless you don't add a layer of obfuscation to the functions uh, you know using a combination of something like frida and objection you'll be able to bypass most uh, jailbreak detection or root detection capabilities uh which uh, improve your detection rate uh, by ensuring you have a larger list of uh, things to detect uh, one of the common things that people uh, developers add into their code if they want to do jailbreak detection is to detect the cdr dot app is present or not right but with checkrain uh, and uh, cdr the package manager it's not necessary to have these things available on the system you could still have shell access root shell access to a device and you could be running in a, a jailbroken environment and right? so your checks need to be more exhaustive Uh, similarly the default example for uh, implementing and we've seen this time and again for okay http the library if you're using the certificate pinner um, as uh, out of the box right this the code for uh, to bypass the okay http script uh, certificate pinner is available and uh, it's just one simple command to be able to bypass uh, certificate pinning for your app right so uh, obviously that has to be twisted so that it can withstand the bypass itself uh Lo ensure your local caches files and sql storages are cleared upon user logout more people share devices than you know right when um, i mean it's it's as it's as equivalent to what you would do uh, for your web apps if you if a user logs out of uh, the web application right and the server has ensured that the logout is successful any locally stored data like your cookies your local storage your session storage all of that is needs needs to be cleared out right similarly when you have a mobile app and if your api driven uh, with the logout and lo the authentication piece any data that was created and belonging to that user uh, for that user session needs to be cleared up and we've we've had cases where uh, we've tested web applic mobile applications where we've seen data that belong to previous users on the mobile app reside uh, in the sandbox and although the sandbox of the app requires root access it may entirely be possible to invoke uh, if you have like an insecure activity Uh, to be able to read the sqlite database from another app right that's definitely possible uh authentication authorization checks there's just no saying how important uh, this is and then it's not enough the number of times we reiterate this build authentication discussions into your app design right questions like uh, and these are very tricky questions that uh, attackers try to uh, emulate all the time uh try and see if there are any race conditions that would occur or what would how would the application behave if uh, two users are logged in into the mobile app at the same time right or what would happen if the user logs into the mobile app from a different device right treat all user input with caution because uh, the context of the data is really important at the login prompt when you're providing username and uh, your password for the mobile app that is your credential for the application but when it reaches the server depending on how you going to treat the data it can end up being something else because the context has changed right um, uh, with uh, document databases like uh, mongo if you have uh, you know uh, json queries going up the uh, json query itself in the data you can um, add if the application on the if the api on the server is going to parse the uh, json input as is you can pass your own uh, document queries uh, for so that the server can process right because the context of the data changes 
offloading authentication to third party providers is great like how we do with sign on with google or facebook or twitter or uh, you know apple uh, for that matter right but it can have its own set of troubles which uh, as recently as a couple of weeks ago we saw with the apple bug right ensure the authentication documentation by the provider is followed and unnecessary storage and transmission of tokens and keys is avoided right uh, this essentially uh, also points to the fact that if you have a token that is set uh, you know poster authentication with a third party provider you need to ensure that this token doesn't get leaked uh, to a different provider like for example if you have an analytics component also in your mobile app and if you're going to make a request to an analytics endpoint the token may end up uh, you know reaching the analytics endpoint through refers right if, if that is the case so the token itself could be leaked to a very different third party provider in your mobile app because the way uh, compactness and efficiency can come in authorization can definitely be tricky especially for uh, multi user multi role apps right especially in apps where you are able to choose uh, the attributes for a role right avoid passing direct references to objects on the server to clients and uh, when i say direct references i'm talking about uh, cases where you have an id equal to 5 or id equal to 6 where the 5 and 6 is actually a database reference on the server right that's actually data store reference on the server manipulating this it becomes trivial then if you haven't uh, implemented your authorization properly which is where your insecure direct object reference uh, issues come up right we've seen um, some of our clients use uh, uuids which uh, uuid identifiers which kind of makes uh, it difficult for attackers from guess doing uh, you know guesswork and identifying who or what the uh, id for a different piece of data would be right but even then uh, using the uuid if you are able to make an author authorized uh, request to a different endpoint and that causes state change on the server for the uh, uuid that you're trying it is still broken authorization just generally that the attacker will not be able to guess it the authorization is still broken though right uh, i would recommend you start with the authorization matrix that shows exactly what feature a user has access to right and uh, figure that out in code if that authorization matrix holds true right the default deny principle uh, should be uh, what is uh, what is the default for all users right follow the least privilege principle uh, we have a this image of uh, what it would look like on a network in a system right but essentially ensuring that all users are uh, you know uh, connected to uh, the backend api with the default deny privilege unless you prove who you are right that that kind of builds all security in your uh, flow um and this uh, goes for I mean, i've been parroting this for uh, my entire career treat all user input as evil especially for apis if you're in the context of mobile apps user data can only originate in many places and uh, it's not only restricted to form submissions that the user may do but could include anything that comes from the client that includes the request headers uh, the file uploads user agents even the metadata of a file upload like for example if you are uploading a pdf right the metadata of the pdf could contain malicious data because at the back end when your api is processing the pdf file the metadata might get consumed in a context that you are not even aware of right and uh, content coming from non human sources like databases and caches which have already been created uh, on the server from a, for a different perspective like for example if you have uh, registered an account and that information is resides with uh, already resides in a database and if that data is going to be pulled back from the database and used somewhere else you could end up with having second order uh, security issues like second order sql injection or second order xss right when uh, an error is encountered you need to fail safely that which problem this is commonly done by a lot of uh, developers but the amount of information that is presented uh, in the response is pretty high and right? you need to handle your error conditions without providing too many internal details and restrict the information that responses send for example if you have uh, your uh, you know some, something sim simple like your get profile and that response sends back information that of which only five items are displayed in the mobile app but the response comes out with about a 100 fields right that information may incidentally lead to uh, disclosure of sensitive information that you do not want the user to be seeing in the first place because remember if your uh, if a mobile app can make a request to a backend api a user can definitely make a request using a different tool like curl or postman for example right don't send uh, excessive information uh, in your responses uh, 
we're almost uh, we were about, uh, about eight minutes to eight. Um, eight. Uh, we have some bonus content on uh, how you could set up uh, a typical mobile hacker lab, uh, and it's not very exhaustive, but things to get you started, right? You need to have uh, definitely if you're going to be testing mobile apps, you need to have rooted or jailbroken uh, devices with you, right? Uh, a rooted Android device and a jailbroken iOS device to start with. Uh, Android Studio definitely for to run emulators, to decompile APKs, to look at uh, code in general. And if you want to build your POCs, that's very useful as attackers go, right? And Xcode uh, similarly, if you want to look at uh, the device logs, if you want to create entitlements or run a simulator. Um, MobSF, I would highly recommend this to be your like one of your first tools that you would run uh, on an APK or an IPA if you've received, right? Uh, kind of skims through the entire app, gives you uh, visibility into what are vulnerable services, activities, uh, do any files contain any encryption related things, any weak hashing algorithms, uh, if there are any hard coded secrets that were detected, right? Uh, gives you an analysis and uh, although um, because it's an automated tool, there may be a false positives. That's true with any tool that out there, but this gives you like an entire picture of what the APK or the IPA uh, contains, right? And you can make an informed decision if whether something is sensitive, something is a vulnerability or not. Burp, uh, zap uh, your or insert in your other favorite interception proxy to test and attack APIs. Right, uh, Hopper, Gidra in terms of disassembly and function tracing. We find this really useful when we're looking at uh, uh, iOS mobile apps. Right? We receive uh, applications from our customers through TestFlight or um, you know uh, Firebase distribution system or something. And uh, once we have it installed on the device, we uh, extract the uh, unencrypted IPA uh, out of the device and then we perform uh, static disassembly using uh, Gidra or Hopper. Right? Uh, Jadex, an all-time favorite to decompile APK to Java classes, uh, as old as the internet itself, I suppose. Uh, Frida and Objection, uh, both for both platforms, uh, essentially to patch uh, binaries at runtime to evade the jailbreaks or root detection, evade cert pinning. And right? you'd have to, um, I mean, the true power of Frida only is when you start writing your own scripts. And right? but Objection, uh, to an extent, has a lot of uh, scripts written, and then you can automate a lot of those things, uh, you know, unless the code is written in a way that uh, has incorporated the things that we spoke about, including obfuscation and shrinking. 3U tool is a standard tool that uh, we use to transfer files and, uh, you know, browse the file, iOS file system, install push IPAs to the device if you have uh, an older version, right? Uh, and also it can be used to extract uh, installed uh, uh, files out of the system. Couple of resources in terms of uh, what you could read and learn uh, on about approaching uh, mobile security testing itself, right? Some some getting started links. Uh, highly recommend the mobile security testing guide. It's extremely expansive, contains uh, information around how you would reverse engineer, how you decompile, disassemble, how you would patch, you how you would uh, bypass any checks that are present, uh, what to do when you're testing for APIs, all of that information nicely compacted with uh, a beautiful contents page. Please do take a look at the mobile security testing guide. Um, the can I jailbreak .com right now is flagged by Chrome as malicious, uh, but it's technically not. It essentially tells you if your version it provided the version of uh, iOS that you have, it tells you if an exploit or uh, a method is available to jailbreak it, right? essentially gain root access to the iOS device. Right, you can simply search through uh, different uh, exploit uh, related things, or even payloads as, as such. Right, uh, XDA developers, uh, the Android forums, uh, and a very old uh, collection of. Uh, I mean, it's it's really very active even now, but it's been on the internet for quite some time. Um, about uh, anything to do with uh, Android hacking, right? You would have. Uh, tools that would ease your life in terms of testing, even development, um, uh, development of apps, for example. I mean, we uh, browse this from an attacker perspective, trying to see if there's any uh, quicker way to uh, fetch data out of uh, an APK. Uh, high altitude hacks is uh, from a uh, null uh, member itself, uh, based out of Dubai, Pratik Ganchandani. He uh, an extensive uh, collection of iOS uh, app hacking uh, tutorials and highly recommend that uh, to anybody who wants to get started with iOS hacking, right? Uh, the Ukta's uh, API security book is really useful in, in case you want to understand how to build secure app APIs, right? 
uh, a link to vyapi is also presented here uh, the tool author is my co speaker ridhi right she uh, the android uh, vulnerable android app will uh, give you an idea of what kind of security issues exist right and uh, especially with a cloud infra at the back end uh, mob sf documentation and the uh, the release candidate for the api security top 10 uh, it's not very complete but uh, essentially gives you an idea of what kind of things to look at if you are going to be testing uh, apps uh, with an api backend we've uh, kind of come to the end of the content that we had uh, we'll take any questions uh, if you have now right our contact information is on the screen uh this was uh, like an introduction to mobile apps and testing and security and stuff right but if you need any uh, consultation from in mobile apps perspective security consultation around uh, mobile apps apis right or anything uh, on those uh, on mobile uh, environments right we are going to be having a uh, office hours consultation uh, on 2nd of july right at 4 pm right 4 to 5 55 pm and the link uh, to register uh, for that session is there in the slide here right so i, I would highly recommend if you have any questions around uh, you know if you want to get some consultation from the other uh, i'll be joined by my other uh, colleagues at appseco as well right akash and abhishek will be joining uh, that day so if you have any questions around design or strategy or uh, you know essentially if you're trying to understand uh, how you can build your security uh, at the design or the uh, drawing phase itself we would be happy to answer questions uh, during the office hours on 2nd of july all right shruti hey thank you riyaz yeah, yeah thank you so much thank you so much uh, for that detailed um, informative talk yeah. and about uh, telling what are the things you need to be not doing when you're developing a mobile app thank you so much thank you so much riddhi uh, so I think uh, we can get started uh, with the questions since you already mentioned about the next week session uh, we can move on to our questions um so, so there is a quest question uh, which shivam is asking uh, even if uh, encrypted data is stored uh, will the attacker have access to the data if the encrypted data is stored where on the mobile device i'm assuming that's the mobile device that so i think uh, yeah, so yeah. he is referring to the um, point where where we were talking about uh, storing data in the app and the mm -hmm. files right mm -hmm. so uh, i'll just add riyaz and then you can add on top of, i'll just say and yeah, try sure. to answer it sure. so uh, shivam um, you can correct us if that uh, if our understanding is not right but what i understand you are trying to understand if uh, when we are saving data in the app in, in sqlite database probably uh, and uh, if or in the files you are saying if you are encrypting and storing is it uh, good enough or not yes uh, that is what is recommended whenever you are storing data on your device it should be encrypted and the next step becomes then how strong is your encryption so we also spoke about um, uh, if you are using encryption make sure you are protecting your encryption keys and also you are using uh, stronger encryption algorithms uh, you should check you are uh, you are not using uh, any broken encryption algorithm yeah Riyadh, you want to add something? Yeah, uh, coming to the point of, um, I mean, encryption is uh, not to be treated as a silver bullet uh, solution in the uh, tech world, right? Uh, just because the data is accessible and sensitive, uh, go ahead and encrypt it, right? That's that's what we uh, always hear about. Encrypting with uh, ensuring uh, the security, the state of security for the kind of uh, algorithm that was used. Uh, where you need to ask yourself the question: Where are you storing the key that would decrypt the uh, data? Because if the application is going to encrypt it, it requires the decrypted data at some point in time to for processing function, whatever, right? If the application is going to decrypt the uh, data at runtime, the key exists in memory uh, on the device, right? So you would have to make a trade-off between uh, ensuring that the key is available to the application at runtime. the interesting piece uh, that you can have there is that you have different keys for different users so based on the installation itself you could generate a key that is unique to that device right and then you encrypt that data you definitely still be able to uh, gain access to the encrypted data because it's it, it, like anything else it's going to still be data it's going to be in the file right but you would not be able to read it right so you could still go browse to the sqlite store and extract the sqlite file you would have gibberish you would be garbage you would be able to read it right 
but the app definitely knows how to read it which means the key resides in the system itself so uh, but then if the key is unique per installation the app or per user uh, in fact the uh, the data that you have will not be able to or rather if you have somebody else's data you will not be able to gain access to that data using your keys right uh, unless you obviously gain access to the keys of that user have got another question so i think riya someone is asking on the same line um, mm -hmm. where do i keep the encryption key if at all i had to encrypt the data at rest uh, the configuration file is where we've seen uh, a lot of uh, times the key resides right or you could fetch the key from the server uh, based on components that uh, are unique to that installation right yeah. but again from the point of having unique keys is what is uh, what it need to be stressed at right if ridhi's key is the same as my key okay. then if she can look at my encrypted data but i use the same key that i have but right? don't bundle your keys inside the application don't hard code them right i'm not talking about a static key for the whole world i'm talking about unique keys per user also uh, i would like to add that uh, when we are trying to um, save data we really need to ask if we it is really important to store that data on the device or not as much uh, if if possible do not store data on your device fetch it from server whenever required right riyas yeah so uh, you need to quantify what kind of data it is right and if you're like storing nuclear codes obviously don't store it on your mobile phone if you are going to uh, save the picture of your dog or a cat in your mobile phone that dog it doesn't matter if it's encrypted or not so quantify the kind of data that you are going to be storing right and if it does need uh, encryption not store it on the server for uh, for maximum security again remember that it's an untrusted execution environment so anything uh, that's on the device can be uh, gained access to which is why if different users have different keys you are uh, using the untrusted environment to have secure code all right um, thank you uh, riyaz and riddhi uh, shivam and adu i hope that was helpful next we have uh, is uh, the question from love uh, so he is asking uh, as a ux designer are there any best practices or general guidelines that we can follow regarding uh, designing around inputs and uh, errors that would be helpful for the development teams to ensure security I was too fast. I can repeat that again. No, no, I, I got, I got, I got the question. Okay. So I'll, I'll take a stab at this, right? And as, as you said, uh, we're not uh, developers, let alone UI UX developers. But essentially, what we've seen is the amount of information that you pass to an attacker, right? If you constrain that amount of information, that itself becomes a challenge for uh, security folks to try and figure out uh, a loophole. I'll give an example. If you have uh, your UI, um, uh, if it says on a username and password field on a login page if you enter a username and a password combination and if the application tells you that uh, uh, the password is incorrect right you are pointing to the attacker the attacker inference is that the username was right right and simply if, uh, using the most common uh, password set uh, an attempt can be made to figure out the credentials for this valid user right similarly uh, in at least in one case where we've tested an application based on the re uh, response uh, the number the content length of the response we were able to identify if there was a valid user on the system or not simply because uh, a lot of times if the username and password combination is sent to the server a lot of developers tend to check if the username is present in the database first if the username is present only then do a password check right so in both the cases if they are returning the same message saying invalid username or password in one particular case we had invalid username password and invalid username password full stop right that one byte difference allowed us to inter uh, uh, interpret that the username check was a separate function and we were able to enumerate like a bunch of usernames right so from a ui perspective the, keep the information as vague but helpful as possible so if you are trying to uh, give away uh, information about login or something like that right uh, minimize the amount of information that an attacker can use okay all right thank you so much uh, for the detailed explanation uh, love i hope that answers your question uh, next we have a question from satyajit who is also uh, who is asking uh, do we need a mac to set up a mobile pen test uh, lab uh, especially for uh, ios pen test um it would really be useful if you have a mac simply because xcode is not available anywhere else and uh, as you progress 
into uh, testing iOS devices more and uh, iOS application more and more, you would uh, want to have um, a, a version of Xcode, especially because there are times when you want to uh, create your own fake uh, app, create an entitlement, and then use the entitlement and uh, to patch something else. The uh, to get started, definitely no. Uh, you don't need uh, a Mac. All you need is an iOS device, uh, jailbroken ideally. Because Windows uh, itself has a lot of tools. People have written a lot of tools on uh, Windows uh, to work with uh, iOS devices. And there are a lot of tools available in Linux as well for you to uh, get started with iOS uh, app testing. Mac, at some point in time, yes, if you want to do more advanced related things. One thing that we uh, find uh, uh, really useful is if you want to check if the app is leaking any information in logs, right? Like how, how you have ADB logs uh, in ADB log in uh, Android you'd want to look at the uh, logs being generated by the iOS device. Right? And we've seen that uh, Xcode's devices and logs option is a very useful place to, uh, the only place we know that we can see uh, device logs. Right? So at some point in time, yes. All right, thank you so much. Uh, Satyajit, I hope that helped. Uh, I guess uh, the, that's all we had. Uh, folks, if you all have any more questions, please uh, feel free to post. So um, if no more questions, then I think we can uh, wrap up the session. We'll wait for a couple of more minutes, no? Yep. So, all right. Um, if no more questions, then I think we can uh, wrap up the session. Oh, okay. All right. Uh, thank you so much, uh, folks, for attending the session. Thank you so much for your time. Uh, I hope uh, this session did help you all. Thank you.